So, three big takeaways that are going to be critical to what we're doing next that are all from Chapter 9. So, if we have some function f of x, where its derivative <laughs> is f prime of x, if the derivative is positive, then the slope of f is increasing, right? It's positive slope. So, the function f is increasing. If the derivative is 0, then the slope is 0, and the function is flat. It's neither increasing nor decreasing. We'd say it's constant. And if the derivative is negative, then the slope is negative, so the function is decreasing. What we're going to be using or going to do is we're going to use this information to try to find the locations for the extrema in a function. So for example, let's say we have the function f of x equals 2x squared minus 12x plus 15. What can we say about the slope of the function at an extrema, at a maximum or a minimum? What will the slope of the function be there? Zero, right? Because if I have something that like looks like this, if I try to draw the tangent line at those, right, I have like slope of zero, they're flat. So I know then I'll start by finding the derivative. What's the derivative of f of x going to be, or this f of x going to be? We just did this in the quiz, so you should still re hopefully remember how to do this. <coughs> Excellent. 4x minus 12. And you could write the plus 0 at the end, but we don't need to because it's 0, right? Everybody's good? Okay. So what we're going to do then is we're going to take that and set it equal to 0. So we add 12 to both sides and then divide by 4 and we get 3. So that will be a maximum or a minimum, but we don't know which. So we know that at 3, the derivative is 0, right? So if I have a maximum that looks like this, is the function increasing and then decreasing, or does it go decreasing and then increasing? Right? Increasing to decreasing. If it's a minimum, what's it going to be? Decreasing to increasing. So to tell the difference between what's going on at 3, whether it's going to be a max or a minimum, I'm going to pick an x value on either side of 3, and I'm going to plug that into the derivative and just check to see if it's positive or negative. Cool with that plan? So maybe over here I'll pick 0 for x because, boy, that's really easy to plug in. When I do that, what is the derivative at 0? Right, we're plugging into this. I plug 0 in. What do I get? Nobody knows. Is it the 4 times 0 part that's confusing, or the 0 minus 12 part that's confusing? <laughs> it must be the 4 times 0 part. 4 times 0 is 0, and then 0 minus 12 is negative 12. <laughs> the takeaway there, though, is that it's negative. Everybody's good? Now I'll pick some x that's bigger than 3, say 4. What do I get when I plug 4 into the derivative? 4. Thank you, Megan. 16. 4 times 4 is 16, and 16 minus 12 is 4. So it's positive. Since my uh, graph is going from decreasing to increasing, we know this is a minimum. 
Now it says it wants the coordinates. So I found the x coordinate is three. And I know that it's a minimum there, but how do I find the y coordinate? Plug it what into what? Not into the derivative. The derivative is giving us slope. I need to plug it into f that's going to give me the y coordinate, right? The output of the function is a y coordinate. The output of the derivative is the slope of the function at that x value. Does that feel okay? Let's see, that's 18 minus 36 is negative 18, plus 15 is negative 3, I think. All right, a um, couple of things here. So a little bit of vocab. These values where the derivative is equal to zero are called critical points, or I think this textbook calls them stationary points. This process where we draw what's called a sine diagram and analyze that to determine whether something is a maximum or minimum. This process is called the first derivative test. And we said that 3, negative 3 is a minimum. We should be a little bit more specific here. What kind of minimum is it? Local or global? In general, from the first derivative test, all we can say is that it's local. We can't say that it's an absolute without more analysis. Now, since this is a quadratic, we actually I do know that that is the global, but the first derivative test itself is not going to tell the difference between a local and global. So at best, we can say it's local. Everybody okay? All right, let's try another that's maybe a little bit more abstract. but will be remarkably the same process. So this one says to prove that the x-coordinate of the vertex of f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c is given by x equals negative b over 2a. Hopefully you remember that. At least that looks familiar from Algebra 2. So we're going to approach this the same way, because what do we know about the vertex? It's a local minimum. So we'll just take our f of x and then calculate the derivative. What's the derivative of ax squared plus bx plus c going to be? Remember that a, b, and c are constants because they're coefficients. 2ax plus b. Excellent. And because we know this is a minimum, we're going to set this equal to 0. And we solve for x, we subtract the b over and divide by the 2a. So we know that that is a critical point or a stationary point. We still need to show that it's a um, I guess that's enough, right? Because a, a quadratic is only going to have one stationary point. It's either going to have a maximum or a minimum. I guess we don't need to show anything more than that, right? 
So that's probably enough. Woo, so hard! It's like the exact same problem, but you put a letter there instead of a number, Mr. Kulik. Yeah, I know. It's okay. So, can you have more than one stationary point? What do you think? Yeah, what's that look like algebraically? Well, let's do an example. How do I start if I'm looking for extrema, maxes or mins? What do I do? I take the derivative. What's the derivative of this f? Excellent. Next time somebody other than Megan can do this, right? Um, we're going to set this equal to zero. And now how do you want to solve 3x squared minus 8x minus 3? You could try factoring or you could use the quadratic formula. I would choose to use the quadratic formula here because the leading coefficient isn't 1. So you'd have to do that long, longer factoring pattern where even if it is factorable, it's probably the same amount of work as the quadratic formula, and at least that I know I'm going to get an answer out of no matter what. So the quadratic formula is negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So that's going to be uh, 64 plus 36, which is 100. The square root of 100 is 10. So 8 plus 10 is 18, and divided by 6 is 3. 8 minus 10 is negative 2, divided by 6 is negative 1 third. So those are my two critical values, or stationary points. Now we'll draw our sine diagram. Both of those we know have slope 0. So I'm going to pick some x value to the left of negative 1 third, in between negative 1 third and 3, and then bigger than 3. Does it matter the x's that I pick there? As long as they're inside the ranges, it doesn't. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm just picking numbers I think are going to be convenient to plug in. So the derivative of evaluate at negative 1 is going to be 3 plus 8 minus 3. So that is 8. If I plug in 0 to the derivative, that's negative 3. And if I plug in 4, let's see, that's 48 minus 32, so that's 16, and minus 3 more is 13. So what is negative 1 third? Is that a max or a min? going from increasing to decreasing, so it looks like this. And then 3 that goes from decreasing to increasing is a min. Everybody feel good there? Now the question asks for the coordinates, though. So now that I've gone and figured out what is happening, or where the extrema are, 3 and negative 1 third, what type of extrema is happening there, a local max and a local min, I have to now find the y-coordinate at those points. What do I use to find the y-coordinate? The original thing, yes, excellent. Oh, I'm sorry. It says find the x-coordinates in the 
problem, so we don't need to find the y's. We don't need to do that. I lied. I read coordinates and I didn't read. I just went, okay, same thing. So again, we have local max. Again, important that you put local there instead of just max or min. You have to be specific because we have two types. But that ought to do us. Everybody okay here? Now, the other version of this problem asks for eventually absolute maxes and absolute mins. Notice in part B. That's this app, the textbook uses absolute where we would say global, means the same thing. If you're ever asked for an absolute maximum or absolute minimum, you're also going to be required to give, or they're gonna be required to give you an interval over which you're searching. Okay? So let's, we'll do that in a second, show you how that interval, why that interval is important in determining an absolute maximum or minimum. Um, but for part A, it says find the coordinates of all local extrema and then classify them. So how do we start? To the derivative, what's the derivative here? Excellent. And what do you do after we have the derivative? Uh, not plug zero in. We set it equal to zero. I think that's what you meant. Now, before I do anything, what do you notice about the coefficients here? Yeah, I can divide both sides by six to like knock that problem down to this. Now here, even though the leading coefficient is, isn't one, I would choose to do this by factoring because there's really only like a couple of choices. But I know it has to look like this. I just have to decide what, where the plus and where the minus is, right? Which should be first? Should it be 2t plus one or 2t minus one? That's what you need to be looking at. Should be the minus one here, plus one there, because I need that to be a positive 2t, Oops. because that's going to give me a minus 1t. Right? So all I have to do is check like the outer and inner to make sure I get the middle. And that allowed me not to have to go through like that long factoring because there's really only like one choice I had to do to decide whether it was positive or negative. You know what I mean? Could you also have used the quadratic formula there? Of course you could. Of course you could. All right, so I get t equals one half and t equals negative one, right? So we'll draw our sine diagram. Both of those give us zero for the derivative. So I'll pick some x's. About negative two, zero, and one, those feel like they should be pretty easy to do. If I do f of negative two, that's gonna be negative five times negative one. So it's gonna be five. If I do f of zero, I'm sorry, f prime of zero, that's gonna be negative one times one. And then if I do f prime of one, that's gonna be one plus, or times two, so that should be positive. So, 
negative one is a min or max. Good, and we'll write local max. And x equals one half is minimum. Good. Um, it asks here though, in part A, it asks for the coordinates. So now what else do we need? The y's, how do we find the y's? Yeah, so I'm gonna plug in to the original. I don't know why I wrote F's here. The function name was H, wasn't it, Mr. Hulick? Let's go fix that real quick. Okay. So we have uh, negative 4 plus 3 uh, plus 6 is 13. Yucca Ruskies. I hate fractions for stuff like this. Let's see, we have one half plus three fourths, so that's five fourths, um, minus three. So that's gonna be uh, negative um, seven fourths. Okay. So far so good. Now for part B, it asks for um the oh boy. Sorry. The absolute max and min over the interval. So in addition to checking the locals, we also have to check the endpoints of the interval. So we have our critical values of negative one and one half that we found previously. We also have to check the endpoints of our interval, which were, what were they? Negative three halves and two. Okay, so all I need to do to determine if either negative one or positive one half correspond to an absolute min or max is check them against the endpoints. So if either endpoint is bigger, then it can't be an absolute, or if either x point is small or endpoint is smaller, it can't be absolute min, right? So I know h of negative one, that was 13. I know h of one half, that's negative seven fourths. Now I need to calculate h of negative 3 halves and then h of 2. And at this point, I should show you guys my recommendation of how to do this with your calculator because we're plugging a lot of stuff in here. And I've just been doing it in my head, but like work smarter, not harder, right, Mr. Kulik? So I'm going to start by typing in my h of x here into y1. So if I wanted, then I could do vars, y vars, y1 of like negative one, just to confirm that I didn't lose my mind. Oh boy, it's not negative 13, or not 13, it's five. Oops, a daisies. How I did that. Good thing I double checked, huh? Arithmetic's hard sometimes, guys. And then if I do that, oops, stay put. Okay, you're gonna fight with me today, huh? And if I do that for negative three over two, I get 2.25. 
And if I do that for one half, I get negative 1.75. And I guess I should check that 7 fourths because, good Lord, Mr. Kulik. Oh, I did that as was. That is 7 fourths, you goober. You put that in the wrong spot. I was like, ooh, they shouldn't be a tie. And then we'll do, oops, H of 2. And that's 32. So our absolute maximum is 232. And our absolute minimum is negative 1.75. Okay. This process that we've just looked at here, where we considered the endpoints as well, this is called the closed interval test for extrema. And I'm going to write absolute in there. All right. Who's ready to see this same thing as a story problem now? The good news is we haven't really like done any new like mathematics. We've just taken the ideas that we developed and we're just kind of applying them. We're like, what can I do with this stuff now that I know it? Because um, if you remember back from your previous math classes, did you have a good algebraic way for finding the extrema for a polynomial? Before, all we could do is graph that on the calculator and do the, like the min and max commands on our calculator. We now have an algebraic method to do that. Wow. Right? That's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. <laughs> All right, so here it says a toy rocket is launched upward into the air. Its vertical position, s meters above the ground at t seconds, is given by s of t equals negative 5t squared plus 18t plus 1. Part A says find the average velocity over the time interval from t equals one second to two t equals two seconds. Okay. So when I read this, s of t gives me something in meters. Velocity is going to be in meters per second, which means velocity is the derivative because it's a rate of position. So I know to do part A, I'm going to, well, um, but I don't have velocity. I have average velocity. So if it wanted instantaneous velocity at a given t, or just the velocity of the equation, that's a derivative. If it says average velocity, that's just a slope. So when you hear average of a rate, that is just a slope. Everybody's okay? So I'm just going to do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Anytime you hear average with respect to like a derivatives problem, it's talking about a slope. So I'm going to use some common sense, and this time I'm going to type this into y1 
Oops, that's not right. We got an X here. Okay. So I'm going to do Y1 of 2 minus Y1 of 1. And I don't have to worry about the division because 2 minus 1 is just 1 itself. So 3. Now notice instantaneous velocity. That's the derivative. So when I plug one in for T, I get eight meters per second. Everybody okay there? I just did that in my head because it was super easy. Notice I'm plugging one into S prime of T, the derivative, not S of T. And then it says, find the maximum height reached by the rocket. and then the time it occurs. Well, a maximum we're looking for where the derivative is zero. So when I do that, I get t equals 9 fifths of a second. So that's the time it occurs. And if I want the actual height, I'm going to do s of. 9 fifths. And again, I'd stored S into my calculator already, so I can just do this to evaluate. And I get about uh, 17. Point two. Everybody feel okay here? Boy, the textbook really went out of their way to do like a bunch of stuff that makes no sense here. Uh, where they were concerned that somehow the rocket was going to reach a maximum height either when it was on the ground or when it landed again. And I can't for the life of me figure out why they cared. Um, but they seemed really concerned that possibly that this critical point could have been I don't I don't know why but they they wanted to do it you just read the book I mean I don't know I don't this is the same question I don't need to do much there Oh, they're using the, the calculator to get the whatever. Um, all right, that's fine. We can do that real quick. Don't have to write anything down anyways. All right, well, let's do this example right quick. So the takeaway here oops, is that when you're doing this first derivative test, when we're making our sign diagram, we don't actually care what like h prime of negative two is equal to, we just care that it's positive, right? So one way we could shorten this process is, you know, like if we have our derivative, we set it equal to zero, we solve for our critical values, So we have like our sine diagram is to just graph the derivative on our calculator 
and look at whether the derivative is above or below the x-axis on those sections. So I notice before negative 2, we're positive. Between negative 2 and 3, we're negative. And after positive 3, it's positive again, right? There's my sign diagram. I didn't actually have to compute anything because it doesn't really matter. Um, so this guy is a local uh, maximum. And this guy here is our local minimum. Everybody feel okay there? I'm so proud of you. <laughs> All right, what if you're given something kind of mean? Like, let's take a look at this. So here it says a fruit distributor has noticed that the weekly change in price of apples can be modeled by the function Negative 13 over 52 times sine of 90 over 13 x minus 5, where PC is the price change of a kilogram of apples, and x is the number of weeks since the start of the year. The fruit distributor would like to plan a sale when the price of apples will be at a minimum. What week would should the sale be? And then part B says... Sales decrease when the price of apples approaches its maximum. And what week will the price of apples be its highest? So um, this function here that we're given gives the weekly change in price of apples so it'd be like dollars per pound, right? It's a derivative. It says change. That's a good derivative keyword. So what we can do is graph this thing and just use our calculator to do the analysis for us. Hey, that sounds pretty good to me because Oops, solving that equal to zero. Ooh, Billy, I don't like the sound of that. Um, now, our textbook doesn't, yeah, I thought as much. So this is weekly change, so there's 52 weeks in the year, right? Everybody agree? Um, and I know that a sine function is bounded between negative 1 and positive 1, but we have this negative coefficient in front that's less than 1. Um, so I know it's still going to be stuck somewhere between negative 1 and positive 1. I hit graph, and I get this. Um, for whatever reason, this problem wants this to be in degrees instead of radians. That's pretty stinking annoying because my assumption would have been they wanted in radians. But whatevs. Okay. So if this is the graph of the derivative, where am I going to be interested? If we're looking for maxes and mins, and this is the graph of the derivative, the zeros, right? I'm going to be interested in this one and this one, right? Which one of those, the first one or the second one, is going to be the minimum? So if we go from increasing to decreasing, is going to be the minimum? Yeah, it should be decreasing to increasing. So I want negative to positive, right? So this one is going to be the minimum over there. Let's find out what that is. 
So I'll use the zero command, left bound, right bound, guess, 31. And then it asks for the maximum, the next question. So let's find that other one. Do, 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 long time to wait. That'll do. Five. So we had five and then 31. Those are our zeros. And it went positive, negative, positive. So, oops, I guess that was an x equals five is our local max and x equals 31 is our local min and that's our answers for a and b what do you guys think that's it for 10 1 here's the bad news though yeah Luke. Yeah, some of them have more than one part. Not all of them, though. Not all of them, but too many of them. I'm going to stop now, though, because that's like it's Irish week, right? And that took way longer than.